the, um, we did interviews, I told you that. These are a few of the questions. The last question that we asked was, if you had a magic wand, what would your ideal way of getting information be? How would you go about using the systems and services? When, where, how? Uh, we started using this question in 2003 when we had an IMLS-funded grant on satisficing and working with Brenda Durbin at Ohio State University. Then we continued this with two other IMLS grants uh, asking individuals this question. Uh, whenever it was time for the visitors and residents study, uh, Dave said, I don't like that question. Uh, let's get rid of it. And I said, nope, I won't do it. I'll give on other things, but not that question. Afterwards, he said, Lynn, for once, I'm glad you argued with me because that brought the best information. And it really did. It was very open-ended. And I think sometimes it's harder to code. <laughs> it's harder to analyze. But it gave us some of the richest information, some of the richest data. So I guess I'm saying even though it might be difficult, in the end, it might be worth it. The diarist, as I said, that was our ugly or ugliest. Then we started asking them some of these questions. And that really helped to get more, uh, more rich information from the diarist. However, most of them decided they'd rather talk to us each month than write anything down. Uh, so we ended up spending lots of time on Skype and the telephone. This is just one example. You don't need to read this. Um, another example was from, and this one is from um, a, a, a U.S. undergraduate student. Uh, another one from a U.S. undergraduate student said, um, uh, they do have a search box talking about the library, um, but I didn't, I didn't use that. Um, I, uh, pretty much just, I pretty much just click links. Okay, so telling us that's how this individual is getting the information. Now, in the online survey questions, as I mentioned, we tried to ask the same questions. And so we used this critical inc incident technique. So think of a time in the past month when you struggled to find resources, information, whatever. And we did give some prompts. We did not get as rich answers in the online surveys, even though they were open-ended, and even though we paid the same amount for these individuals to work with us as we did in the interviews. So that's something else to think about. Surveys, you can get to more people, but you often don't have the richest data. And when we're, we've been analyzing the data, and I'll show you some of the differences, we couldn't, we couldn't drill down as much. Now, I am very proud of this, and so I have to show it. This is our code book, and it's a sample of our code book. And our code book is very detailed. It is online, so others can use this. Um, it came from, uh, again, all of the codes emerged from the data. And uh, you will see that the N1, those are the sources, the, the transcripts. And then um, N2, those are the unique references for these items. And what I like is you'll see we use place. The internet is a place because some people view that as a place. And so um, the code book uh, took us a lot of time to develop. We have examples. We have quotes. And it's great when you're trying to do something like this because you can always go back and pull quotes uh, and you can get your information. Denise, you're nodding your head. You've been here. Uh, and so this is just another, this is situation context, because we were trying to get the situation. And was it something that they needed immediately? And so that also came out of our data, even in the online surveys. Now, unlike Denise, we used NVivo. Um, and I'm not a big proponent of NVivo, but it's the best that we've had so far. It's a database. Um, not a, probably the most well-designed database, but it works. And, but you do have to input everything. So if you don't input your code book, then you really, and, and do your coding, then you really don't have anything in NVivo. So it takes time, but once it's in there, and you, um, we uh, recorded all of our 
interviews. And then we had them transcribed. Well, we started out thinking we would use a US transcription uh, service. They did not understand the English accents. And so we couldn't use the US, and it was a little more expensive, but we used the UK. Uh, transcription service. So accents can make a difference. We had people in the South, and they had a difficult time understanding the accents um, of the individuals with a Southern accent. So these are things that I hadn't thought about, but actually came out um, with all of this. Um, these are just some of the demographics that I wanted to show you. And it, the reason I wanted to show this is going back to that whole age and the Prensky. Uh, and so when you look at these bands, and this is with our um, online surveys as well as our interviews, uh, you will see with that uh, emerging stage, when you go up, now that's that first year of, un of undergraduate study, you'll see we have individuals who are uh, 26 to 34 or 34 to 55. Uh, 55 to 64. So that's what I was trying uh, to demonstrate with this, is that we, we have age, but we were looking more at the educational stages and how individuals transition um, in the way they engage with technology and information. And then these were the disciplines that we had. And you'll see we were pretty top heavy in the sciences for the online survey. Convenience. Um, my colleague, Michelle Faneuil, gets upset with me when I say convenience trumps all other reasons for selecting and using resources. And she said, well, my data don't indicate that. And I said, Michelle, with our data, this, this has come out, even with scholars. Now, it depends on the context and the situation. So it's not everything. And so when you're looking, she looks at data reuse. That may be very different. But in general, convenience always came up first. And I'll show you some of that. Convenient doesn't mean simple. And I think that's something we forget. And um, it's easy to find information online. And that's what people told us. It's easy. And it's easier than ever to produce and, and put content online. But it's not always convenient to find exactly what you need. And what we've learned is individual satisfies. Now, these are, um, this is a quote. We asked, is there anything um, techno-wise, any technology that you would find difficult to live without? This individual, secondary school student in the UK, a female, said, she couldn't live without email because it's an incredibly easy and quick way of getting information. So when you probe, she will email her mother, her father, her sister, someone, and get information. Uh, they talked about getting the train schedule from um, his or her mother. This is convenience. Again, you can see um, this was both the survey and the interview. Uh, and it, it, it is prominent in everything we find. This is a, a UK secondary student, female. And you can see she needs an answer right away. Uh, she goes into Google. She looks it up. Another one says, this is a, a UK graduate student, female, learning and technology. And she says, and since a lot of my academic work is done at night, later hours, it's much more convenient to do so within the home rather than to go to a library and seek out a computer there. And that's what we heard from others. Uh, when you look at time, time wasn't a great predictor um, of, of, of this. You look at the, uh, the top line, which is the interviews, and then the bottom line, which is the online surveys. But it peaks, and I was showing this so that you could see um, how the trends are. And it, the time, available time, peaks with a graduate student, which makes perfect sense. The learning black market, my colleague Dave White coined this, and it's about what Wikipedia. And so, 
this is a, a quote from an undergraduate student female. It's like a taboo, I guess, with all teachers. They just all say, you know, when they explain the paper, they always say, don't use Wikipedia. This is not what we heard when we interviewed their lecturers, their professors, or their tutors. Okay, but this is what they perceive is being said to them. Uh, and it doesn't surprise me. I looked on um, Alexia, and you know, that tracks the commercial website web traffic. And um, Wikipedia is the seventh most visited site in the world and the sixth most visited site in the US. So it doesn't surprise me that Wikipedia comes up quite a bit. Uh, this is another quote. This is um, an undergraduate student, female in the US. And she just doesn't understand why it's such a taboo. Um, because I mean, I do understand that anyone can add information on there, but then again, anyone can make a website. You know, what's the difference? Um, another one said, uh, I go to Wikipedia and then laughed and said, I mean, I do actually trust the kind of wisdom of crowds. And the notion that if people are keeping an eye on that site for wrong information and there's somebody out there doing that, then there's no better thing. Whereas something that's published can get through the vetting process with just one or two reviewers and have mistakes in it. Guess what? This was a faculty member, male, age 51. Uh, so you know, the faculty aren't saying, don't do this. Uh, I love this one. The problem with Wikipedia is it's too easy. Um, you don't actually learn anything, you just get an answer. And so this individual, this, this young man felt that if it wasn't hard to find the information, then the, the professors didn't think they were learning anything. So if it's too easy, I'm not learning anything. It's not worth it. That's why they won't let us use it. And then this is a, a US a high school student, a female, they don't fail you for using Wikipedia, but you get ridiculed in front of everyone for sourcing Wikipedia. Now, I just don't even use it because I can find the information I need on other sites. But looking at the author, I try to use a lot of college websites or the university databases. They really like those websites, those teachers, because they're legitimate. Uh, another is a, a U.S. Uh, high school student, age 17. Uh, well, I guess a lot of the times teachers say, don't use .com or don't use Wikipedia. They like hate when we use Wikipedia. But Wikipedia is always right, so I always use it. Uh, this is um, a, a U.K. secondary school student, male, age 18. Wikipedia is always really helpful. Obviously, I'll search on Google, but yeah, Wikipedia has got a lot of things on there that are helpful. So yes, I use that a lot. Uh, UK uh, 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 secondary school student, male, age 18. I think they say don't trust every word Wikipedia says. Because obviously, it can't definitely be factually correct. But if you were just looking for information, it, it's a good thing, I think, just to find out about things. So they rationalize. Um, when we looked at um, the place in, in the interviews, uh, you'll see uh, Facebook ranks fairly high. Uh, and it's used across all the educational stages. Uh, Twitter um, seems to really peak with the faculty. The uh, Wikipedia seems to decrease with graduate students and faculty. But then I wonder if it's the William, I'm going to call it the William syndrome, um, that we really shouldn't be saying we use this. Uh, but to be honest, I mean, how many in the room use Wikipedia? Sit on your hands, Aaron. Um, <laughs> how many people in the room? Yes. Yes, I often do. Um, and I, I think that it's, we're not saying it's bad, but sometimes people just don't want to admit it. Um, I, 
one article said um, that 60% of the current Facebook users say that one time or another in the past, they have had to voluntarily take a break from using Facebook for a period of several weeks or more. We found that. The students would say, I, I'm addicted to Facebook. I have to get off of Facebook. I had to cut myself off for a month. So they feel this addiction to Facebook um, because they feel they're always on it. Um, also, the, there was a, the Pew study in 2015, this year, that said that Facebook was the um, most popular so, 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 social media site um, for adults and that they gave a percentage of 72%. Now the Google, we all know, um, I, I love some of these quotes. I always stick with the first thing that comes up on Google because I think that's the most popular site, which means that's the most correct. Uh, and this is a, a female uh, high school student, age 17. Well. It is very popular. Again, I went on to Alexia, and Google is um, number one, the number one most used site in the US and in the world. Uh, I love this. This is um, a female gra uh, graduate student in the UK, and she says, you know, she, and many of them talked about Google's algorithm and how they know that they rank things the way that they're supposed to be ranked and what's most relevant to them. Now, in a study that was done, I think, in 2010, maybe, by Karen Calhoun, um, an OCLC report about online catalogs, one of the complaints was that the individuals, the users, don't understand how library catalogs rank. But they think they understand how Google ranks things. Uh, and I find that comp just amazing. And this is a, a male, again, a, a female, a, a male a faculty member, age 51. Sometimes I just use Google, and that will get me started. Sometimes I'll do a more extensive search, and he'll talk about the library databases. One of the things that we also learned is that the individuals, the graduate students would name databases. They would name journals. And so did faculty. But undergraduate students and high school students did not, except every once in a while, JSTOR. JSTOR was one that they remembered. Um, but that doesn't mean they weren't using them. When we looked at the data, we knew they were using these databases, these journals. They just didn't know what to call them. Uh, and so I, I'm, I don't think that's bad or good. I'm just saying be careful when you're looking at your data. Um, don't think just because database doesn't come up or a specific name that they're not using them. Um, search engine, well, we can see um, that's, that's pretty standard. The, it, it dipped down, which surprised me with our, um, with our online survey with the graduate students. But maybe at this point, they're using more of the uh, databases that they talk about. Uh, this is a, another high school student. The biggest thing I use is email. I live on my email and Facebook also, which I'm not as proud of just because it's a time vortex. And that's where we started getting into all of this. Uh, they spend too much time uh, in social media, especially Facebook. Uh, this is a, a, a female faculty member in the UK, marketing, and I love this. Oh my goodness, when I was starting my academic life, everything was in the library. And you could go into these libraries at your university, which were such fascinating places. So I miss that, the old-fashioned library. And so when we probe about the library with faculty, um, many of them were saying, well, I, you know, we want like comfortable chairs and we want little reading lamps, maybe a recliner. We want the journals over next to us. Um, and so they have this nostalgic view of what a library was and how it isn't that way today. They don't degrade the library. It's just a, a very different perception. When we talked about um, librarians, we never imposed the word librarian. And this young man, age 19, said, I haven't called them, talking about a librarian, 
I don't think I've ever talked to the librarians here uh, since I'm not in the building that much. Uh, in one of the interviews, um, we were doing focus group interviews in another study, uh, they were talking about, boy, I wish I could call a librarian. Well, I couldn't tell them that they could, and then that we've had telephone reference for many, many years. <laughs> uh, but in their minds, it was like, wow. And I think somebody mentioned it, or several people did today and yesterday. It's that whole, they, that aha, uh -huh, oh, the library can do that? They don't know. So it's this whole marketing, publicity, getting into their lives. Uh, this is um, uh, another one that I like, a U.S. graduate student, female, age 23. I think I probably have come to the library more as a college student as opposed to when I was in high school. I probably just looked something up offline. There are more restrictions now, at least for me, with the sort of resources that you can use as far as internet sources and things like that. In high school, it was generally if you had a project, they kind of just, I guess, expected that you'd go online. So I didn't have to have any book requirements or things like that. Notice the word book. Uh, that came, comes up a lot, and it's come up in um, many studies when we've done the literature review when they think of libraries. And this one, UK undergraduate student. And so, like, my parents will always go, well, look it up in a book. Go to the library. And I'll go, well, there's the internet just there. And so when they think of the library, it's this physical space with books. Uh, and this is um, a, a female under um, gra uh, a graduate student in the UK. And basically saying, you know, I just want to work from home. I usually work from home. It feels onerous. Uh, we heard about parking uh, at libraries, especially in, in the city. So uh, there were a lot of things that came up. Here we aggregated, because we didn't get, uh, we aggregated library for academic, public, and school libraries, because we didn't get as rich data from the online survey, from the probing. Uh, but you'll see the library's place um, was mentioned, uh, it was mentioned, and the curve, I think, is almost perfect for both of them when you look at that. Um, and again, graduate students mention the library the most. And somebody was appalled about the faculty. And I said, I don't know. When I was a graduate student in a library and information science program, my dissertation advisor never once went to the library. Guess who did? Um, and so the graduate students are doing a lot of the work for the faculty. Uh, so that's why you see that decline. It's not that they're not using the library. They are. Um, but they're using it through an intermediary. Uh, the, the smartphone comes up a lot. Um, I tend to check my emails to see whether tutors have emailed me or assignment dates or if anything important like that has changed. Um, and so that comes up a lot. Uh, this is a, a U.S. undergraduate student, male, age 19. He said, cell phone is probably the biggest thing I couldn't live without. I'm on that 24-7, but that's also like my lifeline to the fraternity. So it's got a bit of a valid reason. So cell phone is the biggest thing from texting. I get my emails on there. I can surf on the web. So that kind of all in one thing, one thing. Um, my computer, I'll really only use that for school reports, school homework, maybe Facebook. Um, I don't know, probably many of you had read the article by Sherry Turkle. It was in um, the New York Times in September. And it was titled, Stop Googling, Let's Talk. And one of the things that I loved was that rule of three. And start looking around you. Um, the rule of three is when you have five or six people and you're at dinner or you're somewhere, if three people are engaged in talking, then you have the okay to go ahead and text and look at your phone, okay? So it's the rule of three. And we were at dinner the other night and I said, um, somebody was looking at the phone, I said, oh, did you read that article? It's the rule of three. And so um, three of us are talking, so you're okay to look at your, your cell phone. Um, but again, that's ob observation. And this is the way they're living. We need to be a part of that, understand that. 
Uh, you'll see here, uh, this was just with the interviews. Uh, the email, how it increases as they get more indoctrinated into our academic environments. Um, the phone calls, they peaked there in that second, third year of undergraduate when we probed. They said they, were, um, they would call their family and friends. They were homesick. Okay, so that's what came out of that. Um, so they would actually make um, a telephone calls and not text. They wanted to hear a voice. And uh, then you see the face-to-face. Um, -face. And, and with the uh, graduate students, it goes down. But graduate work is isolating. Uh, so that didn't surprise me either. Uh, family comes up a lot. Uh, this this uh, young man said, I do like I'll call home and ask my dad a question about something or another, or like my grandparents. And so that came up a lot uh, of calling family. And you'll see how there's father, mother. Uh, when we first started asking these questions, mothers, uh, um, fathers outbeat mothers. Now it's switching um, a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, the fathers were um, the, the number one. And when we probed on that, it was that teaching thing. Um, mothers want to teach us how to find it. Fathers will give us the answer. And so, but now it's switched. Um, and this one, um, the friends have it, uh, they're talking about Facebook. And so just because all my friends have it, it's just an easy way to catch up. And then especially if I need some work to hand in for tomorrow, go out and, fi and find it on Facebook, ask my friends. There's always somebody on Facebook, and that's what we heard. Uh, the whole human aspect, your peers, uh, y you can see friends, colleagues, they, they really depend on them. The other um, were interesting. The other can be online journal person, uh, personnel, a pastor, graduate coordinator, volunteer coordinator, girlfriend, sister. Uh, thank you cards to people who had given me graduation gifts. People at the help desk, and my favorite, the semi-girlfriend. Uh, so, uh, And um, one of my favorite ways of getting information is by asking people. And it's still that face-to-face. -face. Uh, people really still like that. And I think we, we shouldn't forget it. Uh, this person said, instead of, this is the addition to this quote, instead of Googling the whole time, I mostly have faith in the fact that people are actually learning. If I can go to a tutor and ask them something, I'd prefer to do that. Uh, librarians, that's the bottom line down there. Um, and um, that's OK. Sometimes they don't know they're talking to us. Um, because um, that's something else we found out. Uh, this is a, another one from a faculty member and thinks the library system's very good. You can renew books, you can get your journals, all of those amazing searches, just loves it. Uh, I love this. If I had a question about history or some sort of discussion, I would probably call my dad or my grandfather. I don't know if it's because they were old and they lived through it. Um, but I would probably call my dad or my grandfather or my sister beforehand. And I wondered, I thought, that would probably have been my sister because I'm quite a bit older than her. Um, so I don't know, but I thought that was quite the thing. This is my favorite, and I show this everywhere. When we first did, when we did our first initial interviews, the word librarian never came up. When we started doing our second round of interviews, librarian came up and we realized it wasn't in the code book. So we had to add it. This young man, I, we have it on tape, and this was not a good thing to do as an interviewer, and I was wrong, but for two hours I talked to this young man, and he would keep referring to the lady in the library who helps me find, who helps you find things. And finally, I said, oh, the librarian. And he looked at me and said, no, it's the lady in the library. <laughs> so uh, don't impose anything upon the individuals. However, it was very frustrating. 
Um, and this um, is something that I thought was, was interesting. She said she couldn't find a recipe. And, um, she wanted um, to, she was looking for homemade bread recipes. She wanted to blog about it. She didn't, couldn't find one. What did she do? She went to a cookbook. Now I have a story that's the opposite of that. My mother was visiting last month. We wanted to cook. I went, I said, oh, all my cookbooks are over here. And she looked at me and she said, just give me, I'll just Google it. I have my iPad. I said, mother, I have all these cookbooks. She says, I don't, I don't use mine anymore. You can have them all. She said, I get everything online. So there you go. Um, this one uh, says, I look at the organization. So this is about authority, um, credibility. And this is a, a graduate student in the UK. I look at the organization. Usually I would look at the link, the actual link or URL. That usually tells you if it's an EDU or if it's with the university or if it's a .com, we don't use it. And we heard that a lot. Um, and some of them said, I can just tell from the way the website is designed, that it's good, it's okay, it's authoritative. Um, and that's how they judge that. Um, and this one uh, talks about uh, looking at, uh, looking for something on uh, premature babies for a project. And it had a list of, of like trusted websites. And she just knew that that was good. Now, we, I told you we used the survey, and so what we did, okay, all of you uh, quantitative uh, statisticians, cover your ears, uh, because I'm going to explain, we did factor analysis, but I'm going to explain it the way Doug Zweizig explained it to me. He was my doctoral uh, professor, uh, and he's the one who Lorcan, Lorcan cited from his dissertation in 1973, who talked about the library and the life of the user. So he, there's a theme here with Doug. But I said to Doug, why on earth would anyone use factor analysis? That's like they're just like, like pulling straws. And he said, no, Lynn, not really. He said, think of it this way. And so this is what we did, and this is how I'm going to tell you to think about what we did. Uh, cover your ears, William. Um, and so you have, we took uh, two dependent variables. So we took emerging and establishing, and then the other two de dependent variables, which were embedding and experiencing. And then we sort of took all that other data that we collected in the online surveys, he's looking at me, and, and then we mixed it all up, like in that cage for the lottery, okay? So then you mix it all up, and then you start pooling. And those things that come to the top that are the most prevalent, those are the things that we started looking at. All right. So that's my really um, basic way of explaining factor analysis that really helped me understand it. And so I don't think those people were bad anymore. So what we did is we thought we could answer some of our research questions. And so one of them is, what are the most significant factors for novice and experienced researchers in choosing their modes of engagement with the information environment? So you can see here, with the graduate students, scholars, um, and with the, um, those undergraduates and high school students, um, convenience pops up. That, was, that, that came up. Sources for the, the younger, um, and I mean younger in their academic lives stages, not in years. It's just easier than, than repeating all of this. Um, humans. Uh, when you look at the graduate students, faculty, uh, it's more digital, online. And so um, you'll also see uh, that uh, this acceptance, number seven, for the faculty and them. Uh, and the graduate students. Um, they, when they evaluate, they had to accept something. It was satisficing, okay? That's the other term. Uh, the highlights on this one, and this is for the question, think of a time in the past month when you had either a personal, academic, professional situation where you needed answers, did a quick search and made do with it. Number 10, you'll see again for the faculty and graduate students is um, that satisficing. For this one, when you were successful completing an academic professional assignment, 
Um, the one that um, number eight for the faculty, uh, again, was that satisficing. Uh, think of a time in the past month when you struggled to find appropriate resources to help you complete an academic professional ass assignment. Number eight for both, satisficing. With their way of, um, we used agency as the top layer. So, and then they, um, eval they it, it was agency, then their evaluation of the documents or whatever they found. And then accept was, they just accepted whatever it was like satisficing. Yes. Yes, no, thanks for asking. I'm, I'm getting the. Um, this is, uh, I think, in the time in the past month and you struggled to find personal information. Um, look at the, um, there's the satisficing number eight. Uh, and then this is the first time with the undergraduates and high school students, number nine, that anything with relevance came up. And it was for personal information. And so that evaluation, and when we probed and talked to individuals, we were often told that um, the reason that they were so interested in personal information over academic was because it could be something about health. And I think um, Mega was talking about that. It could be life or death things. And so their personal was often, they were more interested in relevancy and accuracy than in their academic world. And this is with the, the, the first two stages. We also have an info kit out there. It's, um, uh, we, Dave, um, Donna and I, and our research staff put it out there, JISC funded it. We have all of our tools out there, the code books. So there's a lot of information out there. Uh, it looks like this. Um, we have some articles, some are in that little, um, that little document that we uh, gave away here, the preprint. Uh, so they're included in there. And uh, just the implications, and I, I took this from my boss, Lorcan Dempsey, it's always good to quote your boss when he's in the room. And um, you need to, uh, we need to start thinking about spending less time on unproven strategies, accelerate learning in a time of change, find better ways of scaling and um, learning and innovation. We need to know our community. And I think that's what it's all about. And um, one of the things I, I saw, how many of you remember this? Some of us. Yeah, so this is the three and a half inch disc. I remember the five and a quarter inch. Um, but I was, um, I was looking at uh, something on Facebook and somebody posted this and she said, I showed my 12 year old son an old floppy disc and he said, wow, cool. You 3D printed the save icon. <laughs> and so, I want to say to you, things change, we're in transition, and you can't just do something once, and we need to be talking to these individuals as they transition uh, through, their, uh, through their lives. And, uh, you know, as Lorcan said, this was our traditional model. What I want to say is observe, not just in your library, not just on your campus, but on the trains, on the buses, in the restaurants, in the shops, um, always be observing how individuals are behaving. And Ranganathan said in 1931, follow the reader from the moment he enters the library until the moment he leaves. He was talking about observation in 1931. Um, McDiarmid in 1940 at the University of Chicago, sociologist, said, study the community. And that's what we need to do. Thank you.